Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Financial Issues Forum, featuring Mark Higgins speaking on his new book, Investing in U.S. Financial History, Understanding the Past to Forecast the Future. My name is Jim Kelly, and I'm director of the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis. On behalf of the Gabelli School of Business, welcome. As you may know, the Financial Issues Forum is a collaboration of three partners, the Museum of American Finance, the CFA Society of New York, and the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis at Fordham. Our goal is to bring renowned experts from many different fields throughout the year to speak on topics and issues that are relevant to the economy, the markets, and to you. David Cowan, President and CEO of the Museum of American Finance, will now give a full introduction of our speaker, who will speak for about 40 minutes. Then he will address questions submitted through the question field that is located at the bottom of your video player. Please feel free to submit questions at any point during the event. We will be addressing as many of them as possible during the session. All attendees at today's event will be offered a digital copy of Mark Higgins' book with information coming to you following our event. And now over to David. Thanks, Jim. Great to be back with you and all of our friends. You know, today I got to start with a full disclosure. Mark is a very good friend of our museum. He's written for our magazine, Financial History, multiple times on topics ranging from heady green to value investing. And I'm happy to report now that he has joined the editorial board of our magazine. Mark has also written extensively for the CFA Institute and his day job is as an investment advisor who holds a CFA. Given our relationship, the museum has known about this book for a long time and is very excited about it. Professor Silla gave early feedback to Mark during his research phase, and we both were very pleased to blurb the book. We are so impressed that we have made it a core assignment for our Fordham class, Booms, Bubbles, Busts, and Crashes. What I feel separates this book is not just the breadth and depth, but the smooth writing style that makes the book enjoyable and easy to comprehend. Some authors of financial history often get tangled up with so much material to cover. Not Mark, who has cut a clear path for the reader that, that adds tremendous value to the book's flow. Maybe his secret is that as an undergraduate, he did not study finance and economics, but rather English and psychology at Georgetown, where he graduated both Phi Beta Kappa and Magnum Cum Laude, and then on to study finance at UVA's Darden School of Business. Or perhaps it's living in the Northwest in Oregon and far away from the noise of Wall Street with ample clean air. Whatever his secret, the investing public is the beneficiary. To find out more about Mark, head over to his webpage, enlightenedinvestor.com, and it's worth having a look. In particular, there are several dozen of his favorite quotes from financial history, and I'll just share one from J.P. Morgan. Nothing so undermines your financial judgment as the sight of your neighbor getting rich. Mark, help us with our own financial judgment today and how we can understand the past to forecast the future. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Higgins on investing in U.S. financial history. Mark. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, David. Um, I am especially grateful for the Museum of American Finance. Uh, when I began writing this book on a full-time basis in March, 2022, Kristen and Aguilera and I met, uh, I think it was on LinkedIn, and uh, Hetty Green was the first article that I wrote for the museum. And your support has just been critical in providing uh, you know, a venue to, to develop a track record in, in writing and uh, also just actually to test some of the content for the book. Also, thank you to the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University um, for subsidizing this and, and promoting it. I know uh, the early registrants get 100 free copies. Also, huge thank you to the CFA Society of New York. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, Mark Hebner and Wes Long at Index Fund Advisors who also have supported this project after I joined the firm. Uh, in August last year. Uh, long story short, this this 
presentation um, and and this book really could not have been done without without the support of all of the the people I just mentioned and many more actually some of them many of them who are on the call today so so thank you very much. In terms of the presentation today, I just start with, with the, we are a regulated industry in finance, so quick disclosure. Uh, the the uh, opinions are my own uh, in this presentation, and it's not this presentation is not in any way designed to offer, solicit, recommend, or endorse any securities, products, services, or or provide tax advice. So we'll get that out of the way. Before beginning the formal presentation, I did want to share a quote that appears in the beginning of the book, you'll discover when you read this book that Alexander Hamilton was so far ahead of his time with respect to his knowledge of financial principles, as well as the economic potential of the United States of America. If not for his appreciation for the role of credit in making all of this possible, the United States we know today, I, I believe, would, would, would not exist, at least not in, in its present form. So I want to read this quote because it really captures the essence of what is embedded in the 523 pages of America's financial history. Credit, public and private, and this was in his first report on the public credit to uh, Congress in 1790. Credit, public and private is of the greatest consequence to every country. Of this, it might be emphatically called the invigorating principle. No well-informed man can cast a retrospective eye over the progress of the United States from the infancy to the present period without being convinced that they owe in a great degree to the fostering influence of credit, their mature growth. What this book is really about is how credit and finance was critical to creating the country we all know today. So it's impossible to summarize a, a 523 page book in 40 minutes, but this presentation is to, is really intended to give you a feel for what your experience might be like when you read it. For a lot of people, David mentioned earlier, financial and economic concepts can be boring and difficult to understand. So from the very beginning, what I wanted to do with this book is make sure it, it felt different. So in addition to teaching key economic concepts and explaining how key events uh, enabled the, the U.S. financial system to evolve. I also sprinkled in a lot of interesting and often entertaining stories that happened throughout this nation's pretty illustrious history. So for this presentation, in addition, in addition to explaining why I wrote the book and, and what's included in it, I also have kind of like some best of stories. So the most uh, surprising insight, well, starting off with the most practical application, which is COVID, then also having uh, some discussion on the most surprising insight, the most inspiring discovery, the most entertaining character. And you have to keep in mind, it's kind of like a George Santos character. It's it, it's really bad, but you can't look away. Um, and then also a snapshot of American industry at its best with the arsenal of democracy in World War II. And then toward the end, I'll share some just some timeless words of wisdom from the past. And I'll read a short excerpt from the book. It's really, it's at the end of the book that explains why this entire process actually gave me a lot more confidence in this country's future. And then we can uh, conclude with some questions and hopefully we'll get to many of them. So just kind of brief summary of why I wrote this book. In March 2020, it seems so long ago now, I was an, an investment consultant serving trustees of large institutional investment plans, endowments, foundations, and pensions. And when it became clear that the outbreak of COVID-19 had become a global pandemic, it caught me completely off guard as it caught, I think, most people off guard. I'd never seen the entire global economy just come to suddenly a screeching, a screeching halt. And it, it just seemed entirely unprecedented in all of US history. In order to make some sense out of what was happening, I just began reading, and I had a lot of time in my hands, you couldn't go anywhere. I just began reading books on financial history. And, and after a few months and a dozen, maybe a dozen books, I discovered that there actually were quite a few precedents that were comparable to the COVID-19 pandemic. And by explaining this to clients, I found that it was very helpful in calming their nerves, giving some sense of what to expect for the future. And it just was a lot more useful than just trying to make sense of what was often random noise just coming out of the financial markets. I also became more and more surprised that nobody had ever written 
a single book that covered the full 230 year financial history of, of this country. Um, so I did have a background in writing, as, as David mentioned, and it's a skill I've, I've kind of often used throughout my career, regardless of where I was. And I know it seems pretty ambitious, but I thought I could take a shot at it. So after four years, I can't tell you how many books I plowed through, 200 plus books, tens of thousands of pages of journals, government studies, newspapers, original source documents. The book finally hit the market, Investing in U.S. Financial History finally hit the market on February 27th, 2024. The book starts in 1790 with the brilliant financial programs instituted by Alexander Hamilton and then ends actually pretty quite, quite recently in March 2023 with the Fed's monetary tightening to contain inflation, which is obviously still ongoing. We don't have time to cover all of the events and lessons in this book, but this slide provides you with a very high level of over overview of the six parts, which are then subdivided into a total of 31 chapters. Each part really ends with a key inflection point with respect to changes in the US economy or, or the financial system. Just kind of moving from left to right, part one is building the foundation of the US financial system starts in 1790 and ends in 1865. The first chapter covers Alexander Hamilton's financial programs and focuses in on the importance of maintaining the public credit. It covers a lot of early manias, panics and crashes, as well as America's experimentation with the use of a central bank. We actually had two, the first bank and the second bank of the United States before the Federal Reserve. And then it ends with an analysis of the economics of the Civil War and the establishment of the national banking system which uh, which happened during the Civil War. Part two is called Growth and Grift in the Gilded Age. It goes from 1866 to 1895. And drawing from my psychology background, I suppose, the Gilded Age is going to train you to develop a better tolerance for cognitive dissonance, which is holding two conflicting beliefs in your head at the same time. This was a period of phenomenal innovation, and economic growth in this country, but it was also a time of rampant, rampant corruption, lawlessness, and, and frankly, abuse. And it, it, it's hard to see those happening at, at the same time. This, this part ends with the Panic of 1893, which led to the rise of J. Pierpont Morgan as the de facto leader of Wall Street. It also ended the era of free silver, uh, prior, until the turn of the 21st century, the United States was on a bimetallic silver and gold standard. There's a big, uh, big story around that. Part three is called Growing Pains of an Emerging Empire. It goes from 1896 to 1929. It starts with a period that most people haven't heard of. It's called the American Commercial Invasion, which was a 10 year period in which the US rapidly rose to become, and unexpectedly from the perspective of Europe, to become a leading industrial power. It was also a time of maturation for the financial infrastructure, most notably the, the third and final central bank, the Federal Reserve was uh, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was passed. And this obviously has lasted to this day. Also covers World War One and the great influenza. And this has a lot of parallels, uh, both at the outset of World War One and the inflation that came af after with what we have experienced over the past four years with COVID. And then it ends with the Roaring Twenties and the Great Crash of 1929. Part four is called the Great Depression and Glo Global Destabilization. It's only 15 years, but it's arguably the most important chapters in the book. It starts with the Great Depression and looks at some of the, the causes of the Great Depression and how we finally got out of it. Also goes into the introduction of securities regulations, such as the Securities Act of 1933 and Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Then it gets into World War II, and very importantly, it explains the role that the Depression played in allowing the rise of Nazi Germany and the rise of militarism in Japan. And then it ends with the Allied victory, which was enabled by the U.S. arsenal of democracy, which we'll talk a little about later. Part five is the is called The Wealth of the American Empire. It goes from 1946 to 1982. It starts with the Bretons, Bretton Woods Agreement, which would created the foundation of the new financial world order after World War II. It explains the rise of institutions as the new leaders on Wall Street. And then it ends with the Great Inflation and Paul Volcker's historic monetary tightening program. Part six, which is my favorite title, 
Uh, it doesn't entirely capture what happens, but it, it does a pretty good job, particularly at the outset. It's called The American Empire Strikes Back. Uh, it starts in 1983 and ends in March 2023. Begins with the rise of Silicon Valley and the U.S. conversion to a high-tech economy. Discusses the emergence of new asset classes, such as venture capital, buyout funds, and hedge funds, and addresses the growing complexity of institutional portfolios, which is becoming a, a big challenge today. And then the final chapters go through the dot-com bubble, the global financial crisis, and it finally ends with the COVID-19 pandemic. This does not cover everything in U.S. financial history, but based on all the stuff that I read, it does seem to hit on the most important events. So the next few slides are going to go through some of the more practical parts of the book. Right now, the most practical chapters can be used to place COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic into context still. There's one chart that I love to use to show how financial history helped explain the COVID-19 pandemic, but also why many of the lessons were, were uh, not used. And the simple reason for this is that we just don't li live long enough to witness everything ourselves. This chart may seem a bit confusing, but what it shows is the years on the x-axis going back to 1914. Then the y-axis shows the number of Americans in the U.S. who are still alive today and were at least 21 years old. So you know, kind of a proxy for being of a, of a professional age. So in 1914, for example, there's literally nobody alive today who remembers it. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why some of these lessons were lost. Also displayed on the, in the chart are events that were critically important to understand everything that happened during the, the last four years. And, you know, just a couple of examples, the sudden stop economic shock in March 2020 looked a lot like the panic in July 1914 when World War I pretty much came out of nowhere. The post-COVID-19 inflation looked a lot like the post-World War I great influenza inflation in 1919 and 1920, and it was caused by a lot of the same reasons, supply chain disruptions, a lot of pent-up savings because of the uh, influenza and just kind of uh, rationing during World War I. But now the most important comparable is the great inflation, and it seems, I mean, we'll get another hint tomorrow, but it seems like the Fed is bent on not repeating the same mistakes that they made during the great inflation, you see this cited often in Powell's, well, not often, but you, you do see it cited in Powell's statements and, and the minutes of meetings. Now you'll note that the global financial crisis is not highlighted. This is because most people actually, well, not you know, definitely most people, but uh, remember this. But it's important to note because it was the recency of those memories that explains it in part why the federal government and Fed was able to move so quickly and massively with monetary and fiscal sim stimulus. So these events really helped tremendously to anticipate what post-COVID inflation could look like, how the Fed would likely respond, and it strongly suggested that they were unlikely to back off until inflation was decisively extinguished. Just to illustrate how eerily similar the distant past can be to the present, I can't tell you how many times I read quotes from 100, even 200 years ago that could have been written today. When I was reading about the post-World War I inflation in late 2021, I dug into Federal Reserve annual reports to see what they were thinking at the time. In one of the reports, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia described the economic conditions in their district during the year 1919. I often use this quote with clients to provide context to the inflation we were experiencing at the time. The quote came almost 100 years ago, but it sounded almost exactly like what was happening in the United States in 2021. I'm going to read it because I remember when I saw this, it, it's when I realized just how powerful reading about financial history could be and really led me on the path to, to writing this book. According to the reports on business conditions, if you think back to the you know late 2021, that's, that's when uh, this struck me. According to the reports on business conditions in this district, Apparently, few years opened with brighter prospects than 1920. Labor was fully employed at the highest wages probably ever known. Manufacturing plants were being operated at the greatest possible limit. Supplies of goods were small. Prices were continually advancing. The public was buying lavishly, and it was generally reported that goods were being consumed as fast as produced. These conditions, which had been developing for some months, 
undoubtedly fostered buying and speculation in all kinds of commodities. In 2021, we were experiencing something that was remarkably similar. And knowing that there was a period that was comparable was, was actually extremely valuable and helped foresee what, what might happen in the, over the past couple of years. The most surprising insight that is on the next slide. And this was surprising because Americans have been running fiscal deficits in this country for so long as a matter of routine that, that few people remember that this is not how the United States used to operate. When Alexander Hamilton delivered his first report on the public credit to Congress in 1790, he argued that it was essential to repair the credit of the United States because even the wealthiest nations often need to borrow during times of public danger, mostly foreign war. That's the quote that you see on, on the top of the page. But Hamilton also cautioned Congress that he felt it was essential to establish a mechanism to repay the debt once the crisis subsided. And that's the second quote. And Congress obliged Hamilton on his first request, but as we know today, did not oblige him on the second recommendation to put in that process to pay down the debt when the crisis subsides. So even though Congress didn't build in an automatic mechanism to repay the debt in the aftermath of emergencies, there was an informal practice of doing this for actually most of US history. On this page on the left, you can see annual fiscal deficits and surpluses um, from, well, on this page, you can see the annual US fiscal deficits and surpluses from 1792 to 2022. And what you see is on the left, budget surpluses during relatively tranquil times and then large deficits during emergencies such as World War, uh, such as the War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I, the Great Depression and World War II. But you'll notice on the right, after World War II, we ran surpluses occasionally up until about the 1960s, but then the United States began spending beyond its means as a matter of routine. And this is the kind of thing that that is not obvious unless you relive the history of the U.S. starting in 1790 and moving forward. So the question is, why did this happen? And for a temporary period of the first, for a temporary period of time after World War II, the U.S. was just extraordinarily wealthy. The country had 70% of the world's gold, which was tied to the U.S. dollar, which was the reserve currency under Bretton Woods. And it had the only, probably more importantly, it had the only intact industrial infrastructure. It was actually massively expanded during World War II as we were supplying both ourselves and, and the allies. So we were tremendously wealthy and we were generating wealth uh, rapidly. Also, we had the benefit of having the dominant reserve currency under Bretton Woods, we replaced the pound sterling after World War II. So the problem is, as the rest of the world started to catch up, our spending became less sustainable, and this produced the chronic deficits that you start to see at the at, on the right of the chart. This seems to be the biggest, if, or one of the, I would argue it's the biggest existential challenge for the United States in the 21st century. The country has been living beyond its means for about 60 years. It, it's it's definitely not sustainable. But the challenge is that nobody knows what it's like when the country lived within its means. So this is why it was so surprising. It's it, it's it's almost assumed that the it's been assumed, it seems like, that the US can run small deficits indefinitely. But that's not how it, it used to work historically. On a more positive note, it is Women's History Month, which makes the most inspiring discovery discovery of this book perfectly timed. My guess is most people on this call have never heard of Hetty Green. Even those who have heard of her probably heard her referred to as the Witch of Wall Street, which was a moniker that was completely unfair and inaccurate. Of all the investors that I read about over the past four years, she struck me as the most talented. Her investing career spanned from the mid 1800s until she passed away in July 3rd, on July 3rd, 1916. This was a time period that was mostly the, the Gilded Age, and it was just almost complete lawlessness on Wall Street, which and you know, women obviously did not have uh, the opportunities that they have today, which made it much harder for her as well. 
The greatest investors throughout U.S. history have tended to share a lot of rare virtues. And what was amazing about Hetty Green is she just had them all combined and there to the fullest degree. I'm not going to go through every quote, but uh, just kind of going uh, starting on the left and, and going down and then and then to the right. One of the things that really stood out about her, she was very skeptical and patient, as illustrated in the first quote that kind of summarized how she approached investing. She was thrifty. Uh, she lived far below her means. And this is something that was often misunderstood about her and why she was characterized probably as the witch. She would she would <laughs> she would wear a pretty much the same uh, black dress and she lived very, very modestly. But when people asked her why she lived so humbly, she explained a comment her father made when he was offered an expensive cigar. He said, I smoke four cent cigars and I like them. If I were to smoke better ones, I might lose my taste for the cheap ones that I now, now find quite satisfactory. And this is a great point that as people make more money, they tend to spend more money. And that's something that Hetty Green uh, completely avoided and it enabled her to amass wealth. She was humble, which enabled her to resist the temptation to outdo her peers by leveraging her bets. This was very common in the Gilded Age, and you would see stock operators on Wall Street rise and fall because they leveraged their bets and, and got caught in, in crashes. She had grit. One of my favorite stories is when the notorious scoundrel Collis Huntington who owned the Central Pacific Railroad and was about as corrupt as they get, threatened to have Hetty's son jailed, not for doing anything wrong, but for you know basically abuse, him abusing the law. When he confronted her at her roll-top desk at the Chemical Bank in New York, Hetty responded, up to now, Huntington, you have dealt with Hetty Green, the businesswoman. Now you're fighting Hetty Green, the mother. Harm one hair on Ned's head and I'll put a bullet through your heart. And she had a revolver on her desk when she said this. She was actually generous, but didn't advertise it, which was consistent with her faith as a Quaker. And then finally, being a New Jersey native, this is something I appreciate, appreciated. She had a good sense of humor. In the run up to the panic of 1907, she warned a friend well in advance of the panic to remove their money immediately from the Knickerbocker Trust, which ended up falling in a bank run in the panic. She then added sarcastically, the men in that bank are too good looking. You mark my words. Tragically, despite all these virtues, men at the time usually characterized them as vices. They especially focused on her simple dress and her thriftiness, which were just inconsistent with the general flaunting of wealth and the Gilded Age. Fortunately, those who knew her true character did pay her proper tribute. Two days after she passed away, the New York Times published a tribute to her and her contributions to the city of New York, who she lent to uh, several times during panics. The quote here captures the true essence of her life and also the unfortunate mischaracterization of it. I'm just going to read it because it's pretty powerful. If a man had lived as did Mrs. Hetty Green, nobody would have seen him as very peculiar. It was the fact that Mrs. Green was a woman that made her career the subject of endless curiosity, comment, and astonishment. Though something of hardness was ascribed to her, that she harmed any is not recorded and victims of ruthlessness are usually audible. That there are few like her is not a cause of regret. That there are many less commendable is one. This is why Hetty Green was so fun to write about. Of all of the, it's interesting to find characters throughout history that are not fully known and, and understood, but this Hetty Green was just completely misunderstood. And it's been fun to at least attempt to resurrect her uh, and, and correct the historical record on her. Oh, one note, uh, by the way, I'm doing a, a presentation specifically on Hetty Green later this week. And uh, she, her her daughter, all of her wealth passed to her daughter who didn't have any children. And she distributed it to, the, when, when she passed away in 1953, distributed it to 63 charities. And one of them is Fordham University. So uh, remnants of her wealth are, are at Fordham. The most entertaining character. So he wasn't called the clown of Wall Street. I just came up with that name. Uh, he, he would go by Jubilee Jim Fisk. Um, now, to be clear, he was a dark clown because his actions would be considered blatantly criminal today. 
Uh, and many of his actions were, were actually criminal in the Gilded Age, but he, you know, he could bribe lawyers and, and run to different states to get away from it. Believe it or not, his schemes were not that abnormal in the Gilded Age, but his flair for just being a buffoon definitely stood out. The author, W.A. Swanberg, wrote a biography of Jim Fisk, and he, and he pretty much nailed the core of his being when he said, if there's one facet of his personality that galled the sedate more than any other, it was his love of notoriety so extravagant that he preferred to be insulted than ignored. Jim Fisk and his crony, uh, Jay Gould, and sometimes crony Daniel Drew, manipulated markets, they traded on insider information, they embezzled, they committed fraud, pretty much anything you could do with money. But he, again, he did it with such an absurd degree that he stood out. One of the funnier quotes in, in Swanberg's book references a $60,000 safe that Fisk bought and, and put in the offices of the Erie Railroad, which was housed in the Grand Opera House in New York City. Uh, and he and, and uh, Jay Gould were the owners at the time. The irony of a safe is that, that Jim Fisk and Jay Gould just robbed the Erie Railroad habitually. And uh, Swanberg sarcastically said, Fisk obviously enjoyed the luxury of the Grand Opera House, and he seemed equally proud of the Erie safe, an innovation costing $60,000. Fault finders sneered at this. Of what use was a mighty safe as long as Fisk and Jay Gould knew the combination? Oops, sorry. One of the most famous schemes in Gilded Age lore was when Jim Fisk, Daniel Drew, and Jay Gould obstructed an attempt by Cornelius, Cornelius Van, Vanderbilt to uh, buy stock in the Erie Railroad and essentially take it over. And what they did was they illegally issued convertible bonds and instantly converted them to stock. And then Vanderbilt ended up spending $10 million buying shares, but didn't gain any ownership. When confronted with the blatant fraud, Fisk proudly stated, I'm just exercising my constitutional right of freedom of the press. Finally, Fisk had a, a little too much New Jersey humor after Fisk and Gould attempted to corner the market for gold in 1969. It almost led to the complete implosion of the U.S. financial system. And when a reporter confronted him, he said, can a fellow have a little innocent fun without everybody raising a halloo and going wild? Jim Fisk uh, passed away actually early at the age of 36 in 1872. He was actually shot in by a rival in a lover's quarrel. And it was a fit. It was fitting that rumor has it that his friends actually wagered on the hour of his death while he lay mortally wounded. So despite the lunacy of the Gilded Age, the U.S. has countless heroic stories of hard work, sacrifice and innovation. But I think the greatest example was the rallying of the American people and industry to lead allied forces to victory in World War II. For those of you who saw the movie Oppenheimer, it, it was a good movie, but it, it sort of misses the point on what was the key driver of the allied victory in World War II. It's true that the use of two atomic bombs ended the war suddenly in the summer of 1945, but it was really the massive production of war material over the previous five years that enabled the allies to defeat the Nazis in the spring of 1945 and then liberate Southeast Asia from the Japanese empire. This effort was referred to as the arsenal of democracy and it really started in earnest in May, 1940 after the surprise Nazi victory in continental Europe. And the key to this effort was a Danish immigrant. His name was Bill Knudsen, and he was just a masterful engineer of flexible manufacturing production lines, which he used at General Motors to completely revolutionize auto manufacturing. So President Franklin D. Roosevelt called Bill Knudsen on a recommendation from Bernard Baruch to lead the effort to convert the manufacturing infrastructure into a total war bearing. Knutson's ingenuity and especially his trusting relationships, the United States was very isolationist at that point, and a lot of industry leaders were very reluctant to expand capacity and, and change production to war material. And just the trust they placed in Knutson enabled him to convince them to expand capacity and retool their plants well in advance of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. It took about 18 months for the retooling and, and capacity expansion to be complete, but once it was, the U.S. arsenal of democracy created just a tsunami of war material 
that completely overwhelmed the Axis powers in Europe and the Pacific, an unprecedented global two-front war uh, simultaneously. So the two, two charts here just illustrate how dramatic it was uh, in terms of the Allied advantage because of the arsenal of democracy. It shows the production of bombers on the left and aircraft carriers on the right. And you can, oops, sorry again. And you can see the United States is in blue and Japan and Germany are red and orange and combined Germany and Japan uh, didn't come close to the production of the United States. It was really awe-inspiring to, to read how Americans just suddenly united after the attack on Pearl Harbor in this effort and drove the allies to victory. And I just kind of like that, the quote that Bill Nutzen at the very beginning of this process just kind of humbly saw how he could make a difference in the war. He said, I'm not a soldier and I'm not a sailor. I'm just a plain old manufacturer. But I know if we get into war, the winning of it will be purely a question of material and production. If we know how to get our hands on it and use it, we're gonna come out on top and win. As I was plowing through books over the past four years, I was constantly writing down quotes that capture key moments in US financial history or articulate key concepts in a brilliant way. I now have a wall, it's actually behind this the, the screen I'm looking at right now. It has at least 100, probably 200 of these quotes. But I wanted to share nine that I thought were especially insightful and, and, and cover different topics. The first one on the upper left comes from Alexander Hamilton. And it is, a, and you saw it earlier, it is especially important today. Hamilton knew that emergencies would arise and that having sterling credit and plenty of capacity would be critical to overcome them. And in his first report on the public credit, he said, exigencies are expected to occur in the affairs of nations in which there will be a necessity for borrowing. That loans in times of public danger, especially from foreign war, are found an indispensable resource even to the wealthiest of them. This is something it seems that we may have lost track of and it's important to remember. John Kenneth Galbraith was probably the most entertaining financial historian. He had a knack for witty, but very insightful quotes. And he often lamented on the, just how the, the forgetfulness of people uh, and the short-term nature of financial memory. And I often refer to this quote when explaining the importance of studying financial history. Galbraith said, there can be few fields of human endeavor in which history counts so little as, the world of as in the world of finance. Past experience to the extent that it is part of memory at all is dismissed as the primitive refuge of those who do not have the insight to appreciate the incredible wonders of the present. I'm gonna skip the J. Uh, Pierpont Morgan quote because David covered it earlier, but it's it's definitely a classic. Uh, moving up to the upper middle, uh, crypto investors should take heed of this one. In a, a little known book from the early 1900s, letters from a self-made merchant to a son, George Horace Lorimore cautioned him about the curse of overconfidence stating, when a speculator wins, he don't stop till he loses. Hetty Green in the, the middle of the page was mysterious in part because she refused to partake in all of the shenanigans of the Gilded Age. And she sometimes lamented why she was called crazy because of her honesty and, and integrity stating people who are honest nowadays are accused of being mad. Ferdinand Pecora on the bottom middle led the stock exchange practice hearings, which resulted in the Securities Act of 1933 and Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Five years later, he wrote his memoirs and emphasized the importance of remembering what happened before by stating, after five short years, we may now need to be reminded what Wall Street was like before Uncle Sam stationed a policeman at its corner, lest in time to come, some attempt be made to abolish that post. And it's a good reminder that often when regulations are in place long enough, it's kind of like when you have an umbrella when it's raining, you, you think you don't need the umbrella because you're, you're not wet. Uh, it's an important lesson to remember. On the other hand, on the upper right, the challenge with regulations is that you can't regulate a conscience and there will always be bad actors and there will always be loopholes and those bad actors are gonna find the loopholes. Hetty Green had another great quote when she uh, captured this truth, when she said, 
As fast as a new rule was promulgated by the body of traders, the shrewdest ones there evolved schemes that were intended to produce fruit for the few and poison for the many. David Swenson led the Yale University Endowment from 1985 until his actually recent passing in, on May 5th, 2021. Despite his success at Yale, he concluded that it would actually be unwise for the vast majority of individuals and institutionals to replicate the Yale model. He was also just in general, highly skeptical of Wall Street creations that were particularly complex. And he had a great quote when he said, as a general rule of thumb, the more complexity in a Wall Street creation, the faster and further investors should run. Definitely a good rule to follow these days. There was a reincarnation of Hetty Green. It would probably have been Charlie Munger, who also recently passed. What few people appreciate about Charlie appreciated about Charlie Munger and, and also Warren Buffett for that matter, is that they have an insatiable habit of reading. He also appreciated the lessons of financial history, saying simply that there is no better teacher than history in determining the future. There are answers worth billions of dollars in a $30 history book. So those are nine of, they're among my favorites, uh, but again, there are a lot more on the wall. You'll see some of them in the book, and I'm sure some will make it into articles in the future. So I've gone a little longer than I expected, but I did want to end with, um, it's sort of a spoiler, but and it comes from the end of the book, but I think it's important to read. When I began this process four years ago, the future looked very bleak. It, it looked like the world was going to end in March 2020. But the, by the time I got to the end, I really had a renewed sense of confidence in this nation. The last two pages of the book are called Shadows of the Future, and it refers to the fact that the future will always be cloudy, but you can make out some basic shapes by studying the past. So to end this presentation, I, I just wanted to read this, and it's going to cut into our question time a little, but I, I, I do think it's worth reading. Over the past three and a half years, I buried myself so deep in books that I often lost sight of the present. I went into this process pessimistic about America's future, but I emerged confident. One reason is because I now realize that America's future has almost always appeared bleak to those living in the moment. Americans' ancestors wrestled constantly with existential threats to their system of government, economic well-being, personal freedoms, and often their very survival. They feared and experienced attacks from foreign nations, a civil war, battles in distant lands, discrimination, economic depressions, financial exploitation, political corruption, devastating pandemics, apocalyptic natural disasters, and periods of civil unrest that approach the brink of anarchy. It is undeniable that some races, genders, religious groups, socioeconomic classes, and other disadvantaged groups tended to suffer disproportionately during hard times. Those who deny this reality do so only by remaining willfully blind to the past. On the other hand, the United States has prevailed over every challenge thrown in its path, and its citizens have emerged scarred, but stronger for having endured them. During the immigration waves of the late 1800s, America was labeled a melting pot to describe the mix of nationalities and religions drawn to the economic opportunities and personal freedoms afforded to its citizens. These opportunities are real. But America is also a melting pot of conflicting values and behaviors, which sometimes weave and at other times unwind the fabric of society. Americans have shown that they can be both greedy and altruistic, prejudiced and welcoming, cruel and empathetic, foolish and ingenious, entitled and sacrificial, and cowardly and heroic. America is a nation populated by flawed human beings who nonetheless collectively aspire to move closer to perfection. It is this enduring attribute of the American spirit that has driven the nation's successes for more than 200 years. Shadows of America's future appeared daunting in 2024. Debt levels are rising, the wealth gap is expanding, political polarization is intensifying, economic rivals are becoming more competitive, and climate change threatens the quality of life for humanity. Those who deny the existence of such challenges gamble with their children's futures. But those who believe the future is hopeless 
disregard the exceptional track record and selfless sacrifice of their ancestors. Ensuring the continuity of the American spirit and extending its exceptional track record will not be easy, nor has it ever been easy. It will require a healthy combination of wisdom to recognize shared challenges, grace to live peacefully with irreconcilable differences, resilience to sacrifice in ways that many believe are no longer necessary, and confidence that the nation still has the ability to prevail collectively. There is now a contagious belief that the United States of America is in decline, but the nation's battle scars acquired from more than two centuries of struggle demonstrate that America is assuredly not out. Warren Buffett, America's best investor of the last 100 years, has repeatedly stated that investors would be unwise to bet against America. Despite the nation's setbacks and imperfections, bets against America still seem unlikely to reward those who dare make them. My hope is that this book helps people understand how the U.S. financial system contributed to this nation's outstanding track record and helps its leaders build a better future for the nation's children. Thank you all for joining today. And I hope this presentation and book contribute something positive to your career and your personal life. And now we can open it up to questions. Wow. All I can say is I think I've attended a full course in American <laughs> financial history in 40 minutes. It's very <laughs> comprehensive. Oh, and thank you. <laughs> before we begin, I want to belatedly thank Hetty Green for her generous donation to four. Yes, you got, you got a 63rd. <laughs> I had no idea. This is wonderful. The development department will be very pleased to learn about it. <laughs> and uh, also, we have a number of questions coming in, but I encourage you to please... Uh, Keep them coming. We, we have about 15 minutes to go. Okay. So the first question I'd like to pass along is from W.E. Perry. It's a rather complex, long question, but I'll try to summarize it. If you're, uh, hold on, let me get, oh, here it is. Not a, Susan Weed, excuse me. Uh, what are the three factors that have impacted historical growth on both stock and bond returns, in your opinion? And then going down, are, are these useful in forecasting the future return growth? What role does exogenous shocks play? And are these opportunities or risks over the long term? Uh, well, there, there's a few questions there. I think probably the easiest one to answer, honestly, is the exogenous shocks, because this is something that was, I mean, I, I guess it wasn't surprising to me, but it was, it was striking, is just how often natural inflection points in, in history, in financial history, are center around natural disasters or war. Um, if you look at the rise of the United States as an empire, it, it, it was World War I and World War II that really, um, that really led to British, the, the, the British pullback um, from their empire. And you know, going back even as far as the early 1800s, what was amazing is when I, when I was researching the panic of 1819, uh, which was actually recommended by a client, Elliot Chambers, I hope he's on the call, but um, it, it really was caused by the eruption of Mount Tambora, which led to global, uh, temp very temporary global cooling, which land led to speculation in farmland in the, the Midwest. And when temperatures returned to normal, it was a huge glut and, and there was a panic. So. Uh, and then the panic of 1907 was actually triggered by an earthquake in San Francisco. So, and, and COVID-19 is, is an example as well. So there's so many inflection points in financial history that really do center on things that were just not predictable. And um, I, I, I thought that was very interesting. That doesn't answer all the questions, but I think that's probably the, the bond returns that, that would probably require a more complex answer. I think that's the easiest one to answer. Mark, uh, of course, again, thank you. That was phenomenal. I'm going to combine uh, three different heady green sort of questions that are flooding in. Uh, and I can repeat them if you you know can't help. Mar uh, Kenneth Romanans Romanansky wants to know what was heady green's investment methodology? That's the first. Sylvina Sirani wants to know uh, that she had heard about heady green, but only as the witch of Wall Street. Are there yeah. any other remarkable women in finance you'd like to mention? And the third one is from W. E. Perry that was mentioned. 
and he wants to know, you know, how do you deal with Robinson versus Mandel? If you know that, apparently she was found guilty. Uh, yeah, I don't know that. yeah, I'm not familiar okay. with that. So, but with the uh, um, uh, Hetty Green, I mean, you look online, and and most of the things, most of the writings on her are do you describe her as the witch of Wall Street? Now, if you read biographies on her, there are several out there, and they're much more balanced. But I, I honestly, more than anybody in history, she was just completely misunderstood. And I've, I've read a lot about her. In terms of her methodology, I, I actually think one of the things that stood out about her the most was her frugality. One of the reasons, so she would, she would always, she had a mastery, and there's a great article, by the way, on the Museum of American Finance site that, that, you, that goes into this in more detail. But there are so many attributes of her that were strong, but she was, she lived so simply that when there were pan she made a lot of money in panics and the reason why is because she ha she always had a lot of cash because she could see him coming and she lived on ne next to nothing she was so she wasn't afraid to deploy it and th that's a really good lesson is if you have ex a lot of expenses and you have a panic you're, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it a as much but but she would just she lived in boarding houses i mean there weren't horrible boarding houses but you know she could have afforded a mansion on on anywhere in New, in New York. And she just had an uncanny sense of the flows of money, which was very important at that time. And she lived thrifty. She, she had the courage to buy when things are low and sell or just hold them forever when, when things are high. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a unique temperament. Now, another thing that's interesting about her, and I didn't know this until I, I started writing a, um, an article on the history of venture capital, but the earliest form of venture investing in the United States was really the whaling industry. It's actually very similar to venture capital because, you know, boats would go out for, for four years, 10% of them wouldn't come back, you know, and one would kind of make, one would make a kid, one out of 10 would make a killing. So, but her, her family uh, was, was very, she, I think she was like third or fourth generation of, um, of a whaling family. And so that taught her a lot of patience, which nobody had at Wall Street all the time. It was a bunch of stock operators manipulating the market, you know, leveraging their bets. So I, I, I know I'm a little all over the place with her, but this, but she had so many talents. She was completely misconstrued. Now, she wasn't perfect. I mean, there was a thing with her will that, you know, she, she wasn't perfect, but she was an incredibly talented investor. And especially relative to, People at the time, she she had very strong values and and integrity, and she was honest, in my opinion. Okay, here's a good question from Robert Schmidt, who's a, a friend of ours, uh, runs the Brandis Center at the University of California at San Diego, and yeah. he asks, "Thank you for your work, and thank you generously for sharing your insights. Do you thank believe you. government debt is the greatest threat to the U.S. And what about corporate debt?" Um, the government, the corporate debt, I know a little less about, but, um, I, I think the government debt is a huge problem. And that's why I included that in this presentation. I didn't include some of the projections, which are pretty daunting, but the, the thing that was most striking going through the history and it, it sticks out when, when you start in 1790 and, and kind of move forward, it, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. It's like all of a sudden we, we just, we just stop stop running surpluses after an emergency and the challenge is nobody remembers that that it didn't work that way so it's going to be very hard to get back to that so yeah i, I think it's a a huge challenge it's not something that's necessarily going to blow up tomorrow um well, it won't blow up, blow up tomorrow but we can't keep spending at this level um and accumulating this debt it, it will break eventually uh, someone with the first initial of I, last name Costa, remembering the global financial crisis is the issue, not just lack of memory, but also the risk of being backstopped by the Fed long after the global financial crisis passed. So what about moral hazard? How do you feel? You know, about so, um, I mean, that, that is a challenge and you, and you have to balance that. And um, it, where, where you draw the line is the key. So in the 1930s, they they weighed they went too far in the direction of stopping moral hazard and that's what allowed you know they, they they put in place austerity the federal reserve just allowed the banking system to implode that caused the great depression and 
the important point, and this is made in the book, is the cost of the, the real cost of the Great Depression was not loss of wealth. It was creating the conditions for the rise of Nazi Germany and the rise of militarism in Japan, which led to, you know, ultimately to the attack on Pearl Harbor. So that's going far too far in the direction of more, you know, prioritizing moral hazard. Now, you're right. I mean, if you go too far in the direction of just ignoring moral hazard, you, you create a situation where people aren't aren't scared to behave bad, badly. I'm not sure if we've gone too far in that direction. One important point, though, too, we'd have to go back to the slide and, and I, we don't need to do it now. But if you look at the fiscal deficits from 1792 to 2022 to 2022, the, the thing that I used to think was the problem was the deficits in, in, in response to the, the GFC and COVID. But that those deficits actually didn't look that much different than World War One and World War Two and the Civil War. What looks different is the 30 year period where it was relatively tranquil and we were running deficits at, anyway. So I think it, it seems like there's too much focus on criticizing the government for the huge deficits during the emergency when that doesn't really seem like that was a problem. That, that was actually what Hamilton intended the debt to be used for. Now you could argue if that was an appropriate type of emergency, I think it was, but um, it's really the, the spending in tranquil times that I, my personal opinion is that that's really the problem. Okay. <clears throat> Got time for a couple more, I guess. Uh, here's one from I Costa. Will the US's preeminent role in global finance be undermined by other sovereign digital currencies? Should the Fed introduce a digital dollar? And what are the risks? Uh, I mean, that's a, a hard question to answer. I mean, I would probably focus on the crypto. Um, hmm. uh, you know, I have a, I'm sure people are going to, some people on this call are going to hate me. I, I just have a hard time seeing a big role for crypto. I mean, maybe the, it seems to work in the black market. Uh, it, it strikes me as a, as a speculative asset. Um, the decentralized finance, I think, is a little more clear cut. I mean, we've experimented with not having a central bank, uh, well, I guess, technically twice after we destroyed the first after the first bank, we well, didn't destroy it, the, the first bank of the United States, the charter expired. And then Andrew Jackson got rid of the second bank of the United States. And it doesn't work. It, it, you know, it, it will blow up eventually. So the decentralized finance, finance I think, is a little more uh, a little more clear cut. Crypto, uh, you know, look, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I, to me, that it just strikes me as a speculative asset, and it's going to, it's not going to end well. You know, Mark mentioned our magazine. That's free for everyone. If you just go to our website at moaf.org, you can sign up for that. His article, Professor Silla actually wrote an article about that, Mark, uh, way back when in the magazine about how economic shocks, uh, panics, crises, oh, twice as much. I got to read it. How many times that there's not a central regulating monetary authority. And when there is, it's a, it's a good article. I'll make sure you see it. Um, Kamiara Hazave would like to know, thanks you, but could you comment on your resources uh, used in writing the book? I know you've read a lot. Are any you want to highlight books, original text? Did you set that up, David? So uh, we were supposed to do this in the beginning. Those are, by the way, the, the bookshelves are a little empty because I'm using them to prop up my camera. But... Uh, those are just like the binders full of articles and just the print copies of books. I can, if um, we have a way co of communicating with people, I can recommend a few good books. But one thing I was very careful about in writing this book is being very diligent on notes. There's there are 50 pages of notes. So if there's a chapter where you want to learn, I, I kind of designed this to, I mean, this is a high level overview and, and it synthesizes the main points. But there are references. There's 50 pages of notes that have references that you can go deeper in in any section. And I can, if there's a way of communicating with people, or if you want to just reach out, uh, you know, on LinkedIn and, and send me an email, or just um, uh, Higgins at ifa.com, I can respond to you. David, I think we're just about out of time. Yeah. Wrap it up. Sure, please do. Uh, Get you. Oh. Well, all we can say is thank you so much, Mark, for your insights today. It's really thank you for having me. amazing experience. Yeah. And we look forward to all of you joining us on our 
our next financial issues forum next week. Yep, one week from thank, today. Thank you, thank you both for having me, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with all of your organizations, and Thanks and so you much. personally. Pleasure. All right, thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Bye. Okay.